Hey guys, welcome back to YT Classroom. I hope you are doing good. So today we are looking at uh, 0625 Physics, Paper 2, Variant 2 from October November 2023. Let's start. The first question that we have is, which quantity is a scalar quantity? Now remember, quantities are only of two types, scalars and vectors. So scalar quantity has only has a magnitude, whereas the vector quantity has a magnitude and a direction. So obviously in this case, it's going to be time. Since force has a direction, acceleration is change in velocity over time and velocity has a direction. So acceleration is also a vector quantity and velocity itself is a vector quantity. So the only option here is time. The second question says that a student measures the average speed of a cyclist in a race. What quantities must she measure? The average speed is basically the total time, total distance traveled divided by the total time taken. The time includes the time for rests. So upon going through all, uh, the first option is the total time taken to complete the race and the time taken. So you're not calculating the distance here. So this option is not valid. The total time taken to complete the race and the total distance traveled at her highest speed. Now we want the total distance traveled not only at the highest speed. Option C says the total time taken here to complete the race and total distance traveled. So it will be option C because it has both the total time and total distance. D has the time taken to reach a higher speed and the distance traveled. We don't want time taken to reach the highest speed. We want the time taken for the whole journey. The diagram shows a series of images of an object moving at regular intervals. The so object moving from left to right. That means in this direction basically. So as you can see, first the dots are equally spaced, which means the object moving at a constant speed. But then the distance between the dots is increasing, which means it's accelerating. So first try in constant speed, hence option C or D, not A or B. There's no mention of constant speed. And then accelerate, so it should be C. Question number four. A plastic ball has a mass of 4 grams and a volume of 20 cm cube. There's a crack in the ball surface. The ball is placed in the bath of a water. Water leaks onto the ball without changing the volume of the water and eventually the ball sinks. The density of the water is, is 1 gram per centimeter cube. What mass of water has entered the ball and top of the ball is first level with the water. So I think that of a plastic ball whose density will be the mass 4 divided by 20 which is 0 0.2 grams per centimeter cube. There's a crack on the ball surface which allows the water to enter and the density of water is 1 gram per centimeter cube. So we need to know how much mass has entered the ball when the ball is basically in level with the water surface, it's floating on the water. So that means when it's floating, the density will be equal. It's first level with the water surface, right? So if the density of the water is equal to density of the plastic ball, that means the density of the plastic ball must be 1 gram per centimeter cube. So we need to find the mass since density rho, which I'm writing here as P, is equals to the mass divided by the volume. So the mass will be the density, which we want as 1, into the volume, which will be 20. So that gives us that the mass would be 20 grams then only it will allow. But we already have 4 grams of mass. So that means the remaining mass that would came through the water is basically 16 grams. I hope this is clear. Next question is satellite orbits that are the constant period in a circular orbit. Which statement is correct? Remember that any object which is traveling in a circular orbit. Let's say this is our satellite. So the if it's traveling in a circular orbit, that means going around like this. The force always acts towards the center. The resultant force is towards the earth. All right. Then the diagram shows four identical objects. Each object is acted by only one of the four, only by the forces shown. What happens in equilibrium? Equilibrium basically means that there will be no resultant moment and no resultant force. That means like the upward force would be equal to downward force, which we can see in this case is D because 20 newton upwards is being planned for 20 newton downwards. Option A is not valid because the force is only on one side. The 20 newtons should have been in middle somewhere here. So that would become true. And option B, the forces are not balanced. Option C, there is no opposite force for this 20, 20 newton force. Next question says that a force, a resultant force F accelerates a car of mass M and along a straight line from, a, from the speed V and the time T giving a momentum of P. So we need to find out what does P equal the momentum. Basically, if it, there are different equations given. And most of them you can see that there are P involved. So first turn, what is P? Momentum is always the mass of the car, which is M into the velocity. Okay. So we can declare option A incorrect and option D incorrect because uh, only B and C if P equals to MV. Then option is B. 
then we also know that the force is equals to f is equals to ma then m of the car is in m but acceleration will be change in velocity divided by the time that is force but if we bring this here that becomes that ft is equals to mv and since we saw that mv is equals to p ft is equals to p so the correct answer should be c which is p equals to mv and ft is equals to p correct answer should be c next question the diagram shows a part of a roller coaster ride with the car at different positions the car runs freely from position x to position y and up the hill on the other side what happens to the kinetic energy and the gravitation kinetic energy so when you move from x to y your increase your speed is actually increased so kinetic energy increases and at the top you have a lot of gravitation potential energy due to your height but when you go all the way down your height becomes let's say zero or significantly less so gpe decreases your kinetic energy increases so option c is correct which shows that kinetic energy is increased whereas gpe has decreased a box is initially at the rest at slope of so there's a box which is at the top of the rough slope the box slides down and it has a rate of 20 newtons and the slope is basically 4 meters high and 2 meters uh, to 2 meters high and 4 meters long the box does 10 joules of work against friction as it slides down what is the speed when it reaches the bottom to solve this question you need to calculate the gravitation potential which is stored in the ball at the beginning so gpe is equals to mgh the mass of it is basically going to be 20 divided by 9.8 since w is equals to mg into 9.8 into the height of 2 which will give me 20 divided by 9.8 into 9.8 into 2 that is basically 40 newtons so 40 newtons is the energy stored out of which 10 is being acted on the what you call against the friction so the overall the force is just 30 newtons the i mean the energy i'm sorry this is not the force this is the energy why is my area so big yeah so 40 ouch 40 joules and then you have 30 joules now we know that half mv squared is equals to 30 joules since energy is not this is rough conservation of energy so v will be then if you do square root 30 divided by half into the mass of the mass of the car is basically 20 divided by 9.8 all right because 20 divided by 9.8 give us would give us the mass into half and two. so when you do this when you solve this in your calculator 20 divided by half into 20 um okay into 20 divided by 9.8 that basically gives me 5.4 to 2 so 5.4 meters per second square an electric car is charged one at an eight hours about 180 megajoules of energy is transferred power so power will be the change energy transfer divided by the time taken so power will equal 180 million so 180 to 10 to the power of 6 divided by 8 hours which are 60 minutes we have 60 seconds so when i work out this 180 into 10 to the power of 6 divided by 8 into 60 into 60 i get 6250 which is 6 6250 which is equivalent of 6.3 uh, kilo, kilowatts the next question says an object is at a depth h below the surface of a liquid the pressure due to the liquid is at the depth p and the gravitational field strength is given g the pressure is given as p and the height of the depth that we given as h what is the density now we know that the pressure p would equal the depth which is h into the density which is rho and into the gravitational field strength which is g so if you just want to find rho then it will be the pressure divided by the height i mean the depth into the gravitational field strength. so p the the density would equal p over h which is option d brownian motion is the random motion of particles in what states of matter is brownian motion observed it's only observed in gases and liquids only the volume of a fixed mass of gas is varied temperature remains constant how does the pressure vary now when you know that when you vary the volume and your temperature is constant that means as your volume increases your pressure in uh, decreases or basically pressure is directly proportional to one in inversely proportional to the volume which can be shown in these quantities that means 
If I want to take the readings, this is V and V, and pressure does not increase constantly as volume increases. So B is wrong, and does not remain the same, so A is wrong. Then, when you see option D, it says that as the pressure increases, the 1 over V, that means um, the inverse of V, or basically this shows that the inverse relationship between the pressure and the volume. Hence, option D is correct. Option C is still wrong because it says as the volume decreases, the pressure remains constant. So, this is wrong, and hence option D is correct. Liquid evaporates from a beaker. What happens to the temperature of the remaining liquid, and how does this... Now, when evaporation happens, the particles that evaporate are the one with the highest energy. So, the remaining particles have lower energy, so temperature decreases. And when the temperature decreases, of course, the rate of evaporation also decreases. Thermal energy, that is theta, no, delta E, is applied to an uh, object mass M, which does not change its state during the heating process. The, the temperature of the object rises by theta t. What is the specific heat capacity? So we know the equation that change E or E can Q is equals to the mass into the specific heat capacity in the change in temperature. So the specific heat capacity, which is C, is equals to change in E divided by the mass into change in temperature. So this formula is currently matching A, so option A is correct. Now, the next question is, a, ro a room is heated by a radiator diagram. X and Y shows two possible circulations of hot air which heat the room. Which diagram and explains why the heating of the room? So, option A says that the room heats at X because air density decreases when the air is heated. Now, obviously, um, this is going to be correct because option A, because when, you're, when the air passes through the radiator or close to the radiator, it becomes uh, hotter. And when it becomes hotter, it becomes less dense, so it rises. So the hot air rises, which caused the diagram, the X part of the diagram, to actually, you know, what we call heat up. So option A is correct. The student writes down some facts about two transverse waves. So it one has a frequency f and a velocity v. The other has four times frequency, uh, the four times the frequency, and velocity is a two v. That means two times a. What is the wavelength of wave to wave? Define now. We know that the equation that v is equal to f lambda. So the wavelength lambda is equal to v over f. Now what's v here? v is 2v and the f is basically 4 times, so 4f. You can cancel this out, give 1, 2. So that becomes v over 2f. v over 2f, hence option d is correct. Now show the straight wavefronts on the surface of the ripple tank. These straight wavefronts approach a gap. So there's a gap here. The diagram shows how the wavefront appears. Now this is a simple process which is called a diffraction. Diffraction. You must have studied it through the diagrams you've learned. Light travels from here into glass. What is the relationship between the refractive index n, the angle of incidence i, and the angle of incidence r? There's a simple formula which states that refractive index n is equal to sin i over sin r. Sin i over sin r. So hence option c is correct. The diagram shows the image correct. Which diagram shows the image okay. from reflection? In reflection, it's basically in, like just laterally inverted. Option A is not correct since it's more like translated. Option B is not correct since it's nowhere uh, basically being just reflected. This is, I think, a rotation, I guess. Option C is in the opposite direction, it's not correct. Option D is correct because, as you can see, it's it's laterally inverted. So what, has, what was on the left has now become on the right, and what was on the right has now become to the left. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, so the next question here is that a student passes parallel rays of light through four different converging lenses. He measures the distance x and distance y for each experiment. Which lens has the longest focal length? Now, the focal length is the distance from the center of the lens till the point where the rays converge. So that this is your focal length, which is clearly shown by y. So it, this question might seem a bit confusing, but it's a simple technique. The one with the longest length of y is the longest focal length. In this case, it's 3.1, so the correct option is B. The frequency of the microwaves used in a microwave oven is 2400 2, million hertz. What is the wavelength? V is equal to F lambda. Lambda is equal to the V, which is 3.0 to 10 to the power of 8, divided by 2400 2, into 10 to the power of 6. 3.0 to 10 to the power 8 over 2400 to 10 to the power of 6. So that gives me 0 0.1 to 5 meters. Which row gives the typical values for the speed of sound in a solid and a speed of sound in a gas? Speed of sound in a solid is 3000 meters per second and a gas is usually 3 meters per second. 
Now, these values do not have to be very accurate, it depends on the questions, but mostly um, the solids are above, let's say, 3000, and the gases lie around 300 to 350, whereas liquids range between 1500 to 1600. A hard magnetic material can be used to make a permanent magnet, and a soft magnetic material can be used to make a temperature magnet. Which really shows whether iron and steel are hard or soft magnetic materials. Iron is of course a soft magnetic material as we've learned from the properties of magnets, whereas steel is a hard magnetic material that has retained its magnetism once you have you know, magnetized it. A power source is connected to XY. In which direction does the conventional current flow and where does the free electron flow? So remember that conventional current always flows from the positive to the negative, so from Y to X. That means option A and option B is not correct because it's saying that conventional current will x to y. Conventional current positive to negative, so y to x. And electrons actually flow in the opposite direction, so from x to y. So the correct option would be option C, y to x for conventional current and x to y for the free electron flow. Which unit is used to measure the EMF? The EMF of the cell is measured in volts. EMF of a cell is measured in volts. The diagram shows the current voltage characteristic. Which statement describes the resistance of the lamp um, as the voltage changes? Now, remember that V is equals to IR, so R is basically equals to V over I. All right. Now we can see that as the voltage is increasing, the current is actually decreasing. Right? As the voltage is increasing, the current is decreasing, and resistance is directly proportional to the voltage. So voltage is increasing and uh, inversely push to current and current is decreasing. So voltage indeed is increasing. Remember to always take the careful carefulness on the axis of the graph because um, sometimes the axis might be mixed up. So that depends on how you use the gradient or any of the interpretations that are made from the data. In the diagram, the rod R is suspended from an insulating thread. When the positive charge rod Q is brought close to rod R, the rod R moves away from rod Q. So when you bring the rod Q, which is basically a positively charged, the rod R moves and this is repelling. Only light charges repel, so if this is positive, rod R must also be positive. Rod R must also be positively charged. The diagram shows a circuit which is used to turn a DC motor to a direct motor. Which diagram shows current in the motor, in this motor. Now let's say first that this is positive and this is negative, so the current flows like this. It goes around like this. It, this diode will allow. So it goes around, comes back, and again this gate would also allow. So it goes around like this. Perfect. This works. Now the next thing that we're gonna see is from if this, if this is positive and this is negative. So this will allow. But okay, here you can take a turn. Then you can go from here. You can go from here. You can go from here. All right. So again, then come back from here. So as you can see, there is no stoppage here. In both cases, it is allowing. So. In that case, first of all, it's only direct current. There will be no, no, there's no current from in this direction. All the current is in the other one, sorry. So this is option is not correct. B would not be correct since the current is, you know, it's it's not the straight line. The current is not shown by straight line. And option C would be used when you're doing through the, then the power source because the negative ones would be ignored. This is basically what you call it seductified. Where the negative ones are ignored as of an AC current. Hence, only option D remains, and this is correct because this is only direct current without any gaps or any spaces. Now, next question is the diagram shows the diagram shown can be completed by inserting components at x and y. The completed circuit is a potential divider in which the potential difference at, across component y increases when the temperature increases. So, what would you put at x? Now, an x would likely to be a thermistor. You know why? Because when, it, when the temperature increases, the resistance of the thermistor decreases. That means the resistance increases, that means current can more easily flow through here. So the more the potential difference will be diverted to this part. So hence X is a thermistor and the only option with X thermistor is option D. And option then option Y would be a resistor. Again, just to explain, make it a bit more clear. When you have a thermistor here, when the temperature increases, the resistance of the thermistor decreases. So the current can easily flow through it. So the potential difference is diverted to the other part which is y, and hence the potential difference across y increases. Let's move on to the next question. All right, so here we have the next question, which is question number 31. It says a piece of software in XY has a coil of y around it. The north pole of the bar magnet is pulled away from index, which causes an induced current. So you, when you pull this magnet away from x, there's an induced current in this. The magnet is now turned round so that the north pole is on the left side, 
and it's taken to the other side of the coil and the north pole is pushed towards end. So let me try to explain what is happening here. You have a piece of soft current x, y, this one. And you also have uh, with a coil of iron, when you basically try to push the north, the north pole of the magnet away from it, there's an induced current. So remember that the lens law, it will always try to basically avoid any changes that are uh, against the, you know, against the induced current in it. So in this case, when the magnet was closed, when the magnet was closed, it, there's an induced current. So when you take the magnet away, it will ensure that the magnet is not being moved away. So that's what we're going to do. It will basically attract it. How does it attract? By making this a south pole and having this as a north pole then. Now when you take the magnet to the other side, your north pole is on the left and it is pushed upward. So when you have a magnet here and this is north and this is south, you're pushing this in. So now when there's already a current in it, it will try to oppose the direction of uh, what you're doing. So in this case, your this the soft core iron would not want the, the magnet to be pushed inside. In this case, you try to repel it. So this would remain a north pole and this would remain a north pole. Then when you do this, when you push the magnet in, again, there's going to be a, a current induced. So it would be the same direction because the poles of the soft iron aren't changing. But this here, it would be repulsion. So in this case, the option D would be correct because the new indication in the same section causes soft iron to repel the north iron pole. It, it will not be in the opposite direction, so because op opposite direction, so option A is incorrect and opposite direction, so option B is also incorrect. And it will not attract also, so here it says attract, so option C is also incorrect. The diagram shows a wire in a magnetic field between two magnets. The current in the wire repeatedly changes direction between a constant value in one direction and a constant value in the other direction. What is the effect on the wire? For this, you have to use your left hand, uh, left hand thumb rule. So, I'm just going to explain verbally since I do not really have a camera here. So you have to point your, fi uh, your finger, one of the finger in the direction of the, uh, the magnet, which would be from your left to your right. That's the index or your pointing finger. Then your thumb points, basically thumb will give you the force if you don't need to demand that. And your current would be downwards because in this case it's downwards. So as you can see, your thumb would be pointing towards you in this as you're reading, start, sitting right in front of your device. Now, try to take your middle finger and put it towards the upward section because that would give you the opposite direction. So when you do the opposite direction, you can see that your thumb goes to the other side, that is, let's say, into the page. So in this case, the forces are different. So the forces on the wire alternate between one direction and then the opposite direction. Next question says the transformer has number of NP in primary coil and NS in secondary coil. Voltage is VP and VS. What is the relationship? So relationship is easy np over ns is equals to vp over vs the number of turns in the primary coil and the, over the number of turns in the second coil the voltage because of the primary coil because the voltage because of the second coil this determines if it's a step up transformer step down transformer so where can we see this vp over vs always try to check you know for the letters that is p and p should be if they're both being used in denominators and ss and both should be used in numerators so option b is correct because vp over vs is equal to np over ns it doesn't matter if you exchange, but it should be on for both of the fractions. Option C would be incorrect because you guys can see PS is being used in the for voltage, but SP on the other side. So option C is incorrect, and the remaining two are anyways incorrect because there is no sort of relationship as this. A magnesium ion has a double positive charge, and a chloride ion has a single negative charge. Which statement is correct? So, if you want to have if you have a chlorine atom, would it it would gain an electron? When it gains an electron, it have an extra negative charge, which will allow it to become the chloride ion. So simply option A is correct. As you can see, it's the first option. A chlorine atom will lose a proton. You can never lose a proton. That will, that will change the atom itself. It will not from ion. So a magnesium atom would lose two electrons. When you lose two electrons, lose an electron. It's a double positive charge. So it, it would have to lose two electrons. So this is incorrect. The magnesium atoms gains electron would give it a, a double negative charge. So only option is correct. Which row describes an example of radioactive decay? Now remember that radioactive decay will not occur from a stable atom, only occur from a I mean it can the gamma radiation can occur from a stable atom, but there will be no change of element. So there's a change in element, so option A is incorrect. And option B it's unstable alpha emission, so and element is changing, so this is correct. Option C it's so unstable there's no, no in alpha they'll always be changing so this is incorrect and beta also there is a change um change 
so in this case our option would be basically option b option b because the unstable nuclear atom and no change in element all right because even in the beta there would be change of element but there would be no change of hence is not correct a radioactive isotope of sodium has a half life of 15 hours this data gives um, the table gives data from an experiment to show the rate of data as it varies the background radiation has not been subtracted what is the background radiation from this now in this type of question there is no simple method you have to use your logic here and a trial and error method so logic sometimes it works out for different people that you start from the you have to check all the options here so 400 that is the initial count divided by 12 is 388 when i take two half cycles of it, it gives me 97 and if i add back 12 i have 109 but at 30 seconds i have 115 because after 15 hours i'm taking two half lives and then i'm adding back to the background radiation rate to see if it works so option a does not work now when i do option uh, fifth that is option b 400 minus 15 gives me 385 divided by 2 and again divided by 2 gives me 96.25 if i add that to 15 it gives me 111 so this is also not correct between 20 and 30 i guess 20 should work so 400 minus 20 is 380 divided by 2 and divided by 2 plus at 20 i get 115 so 20 will work just checking but does 30 work or no 400 minus 30 divided by 2 divided by 2 plus 30 gives me 122 so only option c is correct what happens in the process of nuclear fission a nuclear fission is when the two nucleus of an atom splits two nu atomic nucleus nuclear joining together is nuclear fusion the time taken for the earth to orbit the sun is approximately 365 degrees orbital speed orbital speed will be 2 pi into orbital radius 1.5 into 10 to the power of 8 and as you can see all the answers in meters per second so just multiplied by 1000 as well in 365 days we have 24 hours we have 60 seconds 60 minutes we have 60 seconds perform this cal calculation in your calculators so 2 pi into 1.5 into 10 to the power of 8 into 1000 divided by 365 into 24 into 60 into 60 gives me 29985 which it is 3.0 to 10 to the power of 4 meters per second. The sun transfers energy to the earth through electromagnetic radiation. Which of the two parts are like to transfer the most energy? So that would basically be infrared radiation and visible light radiation. How does the sun produce its own energy? The sun produces its own energy by the fusion of he uh, by the fusion of hydrogen into helium. Two hydrogen molecules fuse together to form helium. So that's it for this video. I hope you really like the video and I hope this helps you. And best of luck for all the upcoming Feb March as well as May June students. And I hope you have received good results for October and November 2023, although you might not be watching this video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends so that they can be benefited as well. Bye.